Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fit for Fellowship, a survival guide for the first year general cardiology fellow. I'm Megan. And I'm Stacy. And today we're going to do a Q&A session with Dr. Jared Hare, who's uh, graciously given us his time to answer your questions based off of his lecture. Fantastic. So let's dive right in. Um, so the first question has to do with impella. You talked about um, it can it can essentially move. And a question is, if the impella pump is either too far in or too far out, how do I adjust it? And what is considered too far out to try pushing it back at bedside? Well, first, thank you, uh, Megan and Stacey, again for having me. And it's really uh, exciting to have an opportunity to be a part of this program uh, with you all. And I, I hope everyone out there listening uh, enjoyed um, uh, my talk and um, I'm happy to answer these questions that you guys have submitted. And so um, that's a really good question about sort of what, what to do with the impella if it moves in position. Um, and, you know, so the, the sort of rule of thumb is that, you know, with an impella, if you're, if you're too far out or too far in, what you need to do is, is first, you know, verify the position with, with echocardiography. Um, and, you know, with the smartest of technology, it's much easier to kind of get an idea of where where you are and all of your repositioning should at least initially be done under echo guidance. Um, and so what I recommend is that you, you have uh, your sonographer there with you. Uh, you have obviously um, a backup of the cath lab if you're gonna need it. But so the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is reduce the pump speed. So you wanna change the P level down to P2 basically to lower the pump speed so that you can move the device back and forth. Um, you know, the device itself has a locking mechanism um, on the sheath and so you'll, you know, it's hard to describe without a picture of it, which I don't have right now, but um, unlock that device. That'll allow you to actually move the, the, the catheter back and forth and be able to move it uh, in and out across the aortic valve. Um, and so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I don't know that I have a, a rule of thumb as to what's too far out to move it, you know, in, in the uh, scenario of, uh, you know, at a bedside type of uh, manipulation, but you know, it tends to be easier to withdraw the catheter than to advance the catheter. So if the, if the catheter is too far out, it's going to be harder to do, you know, without wires and, and, and so forth in the cath lab. So, um, but basically what you're going to do is you're under, under echo, reduce the speed of two, pull back, you know, small amount each time, you know, no more than like a centimeter at a time, allow the kind of catheter to, uh, to sort of stabilize itself, look at the echo, uh, make sure that it hasn't pulled back. Also watch your waveforms on uh, the smart assist uh, readout there. Um, and you should, again, going if you're too far out, instead of seeing, you know, just a left ventricular waveform, you should start to see both left ventricular and aortic waveform. That should tell you that you're in the right position. Um, but again, just make small movements um, and, uh, and, and do it very slowly. Um, but it, it tends to be harder to advance the catheter than to withdraw it. So if you're having trouble um, advancing it to, you know, you try a couple of times and it's not going anywhere. Um, at that point, you should probably just take it to the cath lab, get your interventional colleagues to help you uh, to rewire the pump and, uh, or exchange out the entire pump for a new one um, if you cannot get it in the right spot. Fantastic, thank you. Great. The second question is, is AFib a reason not to use a balloon pump due to issues with possible, uh, possible issues with synchronization? So it, it can, you can end up run into trouble with synchronization <laughs> and, and uh, AFib. However, I wouldn't say that it's a contraindication to using it. You know, it's, uh, you know, the biggest problem being is if you have AFib with RBR and the rate is really fast, there's gonna, sometimes there's a lot of difficulty with triggering and timing of the device, um, but that doesn't mean you can't use it. So, you know, kind of my rule of thumb is to sort of try and do your best with rate control in patients. And, you know, if the heart rate's really fast, there's nothing that you can do, you know, you can actually change the pump uh, augmentation from one to one to one to two, and that will kind of help, you know, keep from having sort of partial inflation, deflation and, and, and rapid um, uh, augmentation. So, um, you know, I think if you're really having difficulty with keeping the heart rate down in AFib, then maybe try a different device, but it doesn't mean that you can't use it. In a lot of hospitals, that's all you've got. So, um, you know, it's better than nothing at that point, but, you know, use your amiodarone or digoxin or something like that to try and help keep the rate down or go to one to two augmentation on it to try and keep it from um, having trouble with the alarms. The newer devices are much smarter than the older ones, and, you know, they have so many different ways to trigger uh, the balloon inflation, so that uh, tends to be less of an issue, but um, it's really the tachycardia that's the problem. Even sinus tach can make it difficult, so. Thank you. All right, so the next one has to do with the purge solution for the impella. 
Um, so um, this particular um, fellow had heard of the use of bicarb versus dextrose as an alternate purge solution to heparin in patients with impella. If I'm unable to give heparin purge, which do you recommend? And what are some of the parameters that I would look out for for this? That's a good question. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when you're look, especially when you're dealing with like an impella um, by five placement, you know, that's a, that's an operative procedure. And, you know, some places you get concerned about bleeding and so forth um, uh, early on. And, you know, giving heparin to someone with an open wound or something like that, a recent incision, they, they may get a little bit concerned about doing that. Um, so initially, you know, you can use uh, particularly dextrose or D5 um, through the purge. Um, but, you know, I think in general, it's not recommended to do that unless you absolutely can't give heparin um, and not to do it for a long time. So if there's some kind of temporary reason why you can't give heparin, just switch over to heparin in the purge um, as soon as you can, because again, you know, rates of hemolysis and stuff like that are a lot higher and, and uh, pop malfunction and so forth. So really should try to use heparin where you can, um, at least in the purge. If you can't give systemic heparin, that's one thing, but you know, as long as you can give some through the purge, that's better than nothing. Makes sense. All right, next question is, how do you choose which type of impella to place? Is it based off of body size or severity of shock, excuse me, or severity of shock? So that's also a good question. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the, in the talk, there's a number of different sizes of impella ranging from 2.5 all the way up to 5.5. Really, you're probably not going to see the 2.5 device used very much. And that's really the only place that really has is a facilitated PCI. And even then, I think most people are using the CP device for that now also, just because it's a better, um, you know, more stable and a better flow rate uh, that you get with that. So you may not even really run into that too much anymore. And so really the big difference between the 5.5 or 5.0 and the, and the CP is sort of partial hemodynamic support versus full hemodynamic support. And also, you know, sort of how it can be put in. So, you know, the Impella 5.5 takes a surgeon, a cut down and planning, right? So that's not something that's done kind of like in a emergent situation typically, right? So if you're in the cath lab with an acute MI or something like that, you know, and you're having trouble, you're not going to call the cardiac surgeon in to come do a, you know, an axillary cut down, then put in a 5.0 impella, right? It's going to be the impella CP or ECMO or something like that temporarily until you bridge over to the next thing, because it, it does take more planning. So if you're really looking for a full hemodynamic support, you need the 5.5. Um, if you want some temporary support, that's going to either, um, you know, in conjunction with ionotropic therapy, or you're in the cath lab, and you need to do something quick, then the impella CP is probably better. Um, but in the end, I think, you know, the Impella CP doesn't provide uh, full support. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, and it has a higher, at least in my personal experience, a higher rate of hemolysis and things like that too. So um, I think because the size of the pump is smaller, but um, so it really comes down to whether you need full support or not. Great, thank you. Fantastic. So the next question has to do with ECMO. And the question is, what do I do if, for whatever reason, the ECMO um, fails? So, for example, the you know, the machine fails, and it starts to clot off, and is unable to deliver blood back to the patient. So, the first thing is cross your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is hopefully something you never run into. Um, you know, the ECMO uh, devices, the pumps will always have a uh, hand crank device usually with them too. So, if something shuts down, you basically start crank in the wheel and it, and it works like the, the, the external pump would have been um, doing. And so, uh, you know, typically that involves, you know, called a perfusion or the, your particular center who, who runs it, whether it's perfusion or there's nurses or something, it just depends. But, you know, in an emergency, you start the hand crank uh, device to keep the blood flow going um, and then uh, call your surgeons and your perfusion tech to try and change out the pump. Basically, that's usually what you need to do. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, if these things happen in an emergency, it, it often is, is not survivable. Um, mm -hmm. So you hope that that never happens to you. Okay. Um, so next question for VA ECMO, how do you troubleshoot the issue of retrograde flow and mixing of venous arterial blood in the heart? <laughs> Great question. Um, and again, this is, you know, an issue specifically with peripheral VA ECMO. Um, you know, with central ECMO, uh, you should not have this problem. Um, and again, because of peripheral ECMO and having retrograde flow and, and not necessarily emptying the heart and having some, you know, circulation that's not getting into the oxygenator, um, there's a couple of things that, that you okay. kind of want to think about. So the first thing is sort of, is it happening or not? And the way to know about that 
is uh, is to have a, a um, an ABG or or a, you know a, a saturation in a distal part of the of the extremity. So we always put it in the right a radial ar arterial line in the right radius, right radial artery, so that we can draw our ABGs off of that. Because that being sort of the most distal thing to it. And so if the ABG is low there, the PO2 is low, then you know you're not getting good oxygen delivery to the upper part of the body. So at that point, what you need to do is is figure out how to vent the heart, you know, or actually. So, you know, if you're not contracting or something like that, you want to try and allow uh, better uh, LV decompression. Um, so either putting in a drainage cannula or, you know, an impeller or a balloon pump or something to try and help with that. The other thing is if you're really still having trouble with it after then, you can actually do what's called uh, VAV ECMO, where you have two venous lines, right, where you actually then <clears throat> perfuse the upper, uh, upper, um, part of the, um, upper part of the body. So... Great. Fantastic. Um, and then the last question that we have um, is that in the event that the patient codes, um, what do I do with the device? So for example, Impella versus intraatic balloon pump versus ECMO. So we'll take them one at a time. So Impella, again, much like when you're positioning it, what you want to do is uh, reduce the, the power level down to like P2 or P3, and then run your code like you normally would um, and, you know, once the, you have ROSC, you can restart the pump basically back up to the prior setting that it was on. Um, for a balloon pump, you just put it on standby basically and do your code the way you normally would. Um, and then once the, you have ROSC, you can turn the pump back on one-to-one. -one. Um, and then for ECMO, you know, there isn't necessarily codes in ECMO, right? So, you know, it's all chemical at this point, right? So, you, you know, if you're dealing with hypotension or PEA, I mean, the pump is biventricular, full biventricular support. So, right. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's a bivad. So you're going to have continuous flow regardless of what's happening. Um, if you're having issues with filling or something like that, that may be one problem, but, um, you know, giving epi, things like that to try and, um, you know, keep blood pressures up and so forth. But, you know, if somebody goes into VF on ECMO, unfortunately, the outcome is typically poor. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and a fantastic lecture as well. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank so, you very much. So we'll see you all next week. Have a good uh, rest of the week.